Hello everybody, how's it going today? Goldplaz with 231 here. Back in today, talk about Kagurabachi, chapter number 47. This chapter's titled, Aruha. And, I mean, that's a very valid chapter title, being that as we sort of knew about what last chapter had going on, that we'd probably be focusing on Aruha this chapter, and, well, I guess we are being it's a chapter's name out of him. I've never seen something more... In, I, I don't know. I don't have anything planned for the beginning gag bit of this video. All I know is that this is a solid chapter of Kagurabachi. I mean, as we'll get through in this chapter, we really get a lot into Aruha's character. And I don't know how the author of this series, of course, Takeru Hokuzono, always does this. But it seems like every character introduction they've had recently has just really been on point and has made a very memorable character. But... I guess we just need to hop into it. So, starting with everything, we need to talk about what happened last time on Kagurabachi. And of course, we had the whole Kabunagi exam, not really an exam, sort of like a, hey, Chiro, you want to join the Kabunagi? Well, you've got to let them talk to you first. And Chiro did talk to them. And there's the whole conflicting with Sideburns guy and all of that stuff going on until eventually um, we learned that one of the Sanzo, which are the fortresses, which the sword bears are put in, was attacked. And one of them was attacked. And that was the Kokugoku Hot, sh uh, hot Spring, where one of the Enchanted Blade users, um, Ruha, was. And we pretty much learned her name last time, but we get a lot more in them on them this time. And really just to start and just hop into chapter and just get this video rolling. First, I've got to say, of course, Shonen Jump had Kagurabachi as the lead series this week. So, of course, Kagurabachi has a lead double page color page along with a singular color page before it. This singular color page is a really cool one because it not only has like the Kagurabachi title on it, but we also see sort of semi-colored images of the other four sword bears that, of course, we saw last time. Or not last time, two chapters ago. Of course, we see the more blacksmith type dude we see the girl of the group um we see the blind guy smoking a cigarette which fucking badass he also wears glasses any character who fucking is blind and wears glasses is just immediately fucking amazing i don't know what it is about that sort of character and of course we see um gang sign dude who of course we now know is aruha and at the bottom of this page we just get the information of the sword bear assassination arc which means that, yeah, we're in finally that new arc of Kagurabachi. So, like, we had those pretty much two intermediate chapters in between the Rakuzachi auction house, and we're now on to the Sword Bear assassination arc, which is just really cool. Um, I wonder by the end of this arc if we're going to be introduced into all of the other Sword Bears or what. Just really don't know at this point, but yeah, pretty cool. And then our actual color page is just a really simple one of course it is um takiru hokuzono using the regular colors that he uses which is red black gray and white and that's really it i think we see there's some blue in here just because um hakari's uh, eye is blue which all right but pretty much we see the hakari's on here he's got the iso mask on we see shiba um tafuku and also Hyuki, along with Chihiro, of course, wielding the Inten sword. As we just get, like, the whole thing of, like, yeah, Kagurabachi, it's been into magazine for a year. And I'd say that's pretty cool. But as we start off this chapter of Kagurabachi, we start off in a few pages of flashback. As we just get the introduction to Yoji Aruha. As we pretty much see this character that we know. And we just get some dialogue to saying, Contracted owner of the Enchanted Blade kume yori very awesome we now have in our title of the chain of blades we did not know this before so this makes we now know what three of them are officially because of course we have the cloud gouger which no longer sort of exists that sojo had the shinuchi who we know a little bit about its bear and by like design principle and that's really it and then, of course, now we have the Kume Yuri. So we don't know what the other three um, sword bears swords are, but we now have a third or technically fourth along with Inten. But out of the six original, we now know Kume Yuri, but we don't get any other sort of details on it this chapter, right? As we just get a little bit of narration from Aruha's uh, point of view at this point. As he just goes through and just thinks like, hey, 18 years ago, the day Mr. Rokuhira entrusted me with Kume Yuri, it was the high point of my life. I fought hard in the Seitai War. And he's like, seriously, Mr. Rokuhira is incredibly cool. 
there aren't a lot of people out there with that kind of ironclad composure. As we sort of see a little bit of a, um, a flashback image of, of course, um, Rokuhira or Kunishige, as I think it's a little bit of easier to say because we only know one character in the series whose name is Kunishige, and we know two that can sort of go by Rokuhira, but whatever. As we pretty much just see that um, Kunishige is like, hey, Uruha, this blade suits you. And then on the next page, we just see it again like, Uruha, this blade suits you. And um, what's it called? Uruha sort of just thinks some more and continues on this narration just saying like, hey, those eyes of his, unreal, aren't they? I know I've said this a bunch of times, but fighting for my life for that guy was really the greatest honor I could have ever had. As we just get in our image of like, Aruha, this blade suits you. As we're just getting like that point across that, um, Aruha really likes Kunishige, as that sort of goes on. As we just get a little bit of more narration just saying like, hey, as soon as the war was over, I voluntarily returned the Enchanted Blade to Mr. Roku here per his request, and after that, he disappeared. I didn't hear a word of him for 15 years. And all of a sudden, we cut to a moment where, um, three years ago at this point, where Uruha is sitting around and getting briefed by some of the, um, people that are fighting, or some of the, um, how do I phrase this? Some of the Kabunagi members who will have been stationed at the um, Kokugoku Hot Spring. And we see one of them in specific with the beanie. We saw this character design last chapter whenever we saw that the Kokugoku Fortress had been raided. As we, this character pretty much just says, like, we don't get a name for him, so I'm just going to call him Beanie Guy. As um, Beanie Guy just says, like, hey, um, a group called the Hishaku killed Kunishige, and they also stole all of the Enchanted Blades. And we see that Aruha hears this and sort of just like breaks in. It's like, what? Are, are you kidding? And the beanie guy just continues saying like, hey, they already killed Misaka, the bear of the cloud gouger. Interesting. We know a bit of the history of that blade now. And obviously it seemed like there were two women on the team. So not just a one that we've seen so far, which, hey, I love diversity here and there. But Beanie just continues saying like, hey, so what this means is they're going to eventually come after each warrior contracted with the Enchanted Blades so they can use the blades they stole, right? And we see the Ruha is just like, damn it, the Shaku, like, why they have to do this? Beanie just says like, hey, I mean, they are enemies of the state, and if they're able to wield the Enchanted Blades, then this country is going to be destroyed. The country that you fought so hard to protect all of those years ago, right? And all of a sudden, um, we see the Ruha is just like done with this. We see that he's actually got a cup of sake in front of him, but he's knocked it over in sort of his fit of being very upset after, of course, hearing that Kunishige is dead. As Beanie pretty much continues and just explains like, hey, I won't let that happen. This time I will protect you. As we get a little bit more narration from Aruha, just going like, hey, the Kokugoku Fortress is a natural hot spring in the Southern Toyama Prefecture. I lived there in seclusion from the outside world, protected by 14 elite Kabanagi fighters. And we pretty much just see that he says a few things like, hey, every day I um, bathe in the same pools with the same people. As we see that Aruha is sitting here, as I didn't mention this earlier about Aruha, sort of more design that we can actually see here. Um, it's very interesting is he's got like some hair and it's sort of like tied back in a sort of bun sort of ponytail we see that he's sort of got like very loose hair and also he's sort of got like this weird i guess it's like eye shadow or something around the back of his eyes it sort of leave a very interesting mark i don't really quite know how to describe it but it does look like a very interesting design here right but we see that like yeah ruha sitting in the hot spring with some people around him he's like yeah babe, every day babe, the same pulls the same people this isn't so bad beanie guy is there and he pretty much is like hey um, hey, by the way, there was a message from headquarters the other day um, about some kid with like a seventh enchanted blade and something about um, him being Mr. Roku here's son. And pretty much we just see that um, Aruha is just like, man, like that's, that's really interesting, right? And Beanie Guy just says like, hey, it's actually very interesting right now because they haven't ascertained whether or not he's actually Roku here's son. It's sort of just like sayings here and there, right? And Aruha pretty much just like comes to the deduction all of a sudden just saying like, yeah, this guy must be an imposter. I mean, the nerve of that guy claiming um, Ro Mr. Roku here's name. And we see a beanie's just like, how can you really be sure that like he's not actually his son? But Aruha says like, hey, I'm actually very sure of this 
There is no way that Mr. Roku here could have ever taken care of a kid. Which is something that we actually saw, and we saw that mainly Chihiro took care of his father, so a pretty interesting little dichotomy that's going on there. At this point, we just get a little more narration from Maruha, just going like, Hey, I was ready to die at any time for three long years after I learned after learned of Mr. Rokier's death. I truly lost my will to live. Until one day we see, actually the day prior to this in the manga, we see the Kokugoku Hot Spring was invaded. As we pretty much see, there's a bunch of yelling and screaming by all the Kabunagi members in the fortress going like, Invaders! Like, Mr. Aruha, you gotta come this way! And like, everybody report to headquarters! Like, just inform them, they're wearing them the Shaku! Like, who's in Chamboyed or like, spirit reactions? Like, there's a bunch of bad stuff going on here, right? And we eventually see that as Aruha is exiting the Kokugoku Fortress, we see the beanie guys there at the door sort of escorting him out and just saying like, Hey, these guys have some really weird kind of weapon. Like, honestly, we have no chance in hell of beating them, but we can always buy you some time. Run, Aruha. We cannot let them take your life. As we end this flashback here, as we suddenly cut to eight kilometers from the Kokugoku Hot Spring, as we see that they're inside, as we see Aruha running along inside of a train station, right? As we sort of get a little middle note of the um, beanie guy I just told him before, like, hey, head for the uh, Otago station, we'll contact headquarters and um, let them know that we um, sent you there and we'll have them also send you bodyguards immediately. We sort of see that Aruha is running around the station here and he's sort of just thinking like, new bodyguards, like who could they possibly send if um, those guys weren't tough enough to hold down and beat out those Hushaku members? Like, hey, it would take like at least 10 warriors on the level of Aizami of Hyuki to even beat them and protect me. And he's sort of just like running around just thinking like, all right, the station's nearby and there's no sign of the m and &E. It's like, where are my protectors? This is really bad. As we just see he's like mindlessly running around the Otago station, just like not being able to do anything until suddenly somebody runs up and is like, hey, excuse me. And we see this is none other than Hakari who is here, right? And we see he's got a little bit of a sword with him, and he's just like, he's like, hey, um, you're Mr. Aruha, right? And Aruha's like, show me your insignia, right? And um, Hyuki, or not Hyuki, um, Hakari's like, oh yeah, that's right. As we see that he like takes something out of his pocket and like shows it off, right? And Aruha is just like, so you're my new protection? And he's like, how did you end up knowing like it was me who you were supposed to come after? And Hyu or not Hyuki, oh uh, gosh, why does there have to be two pivotal characters with the same name that serve the same letter? It's so confusing. It's not as confusing as World Trigger is, because that series is just too many characters, but Hyuki and Akari just always trip me up in this series for some reason. I don't honestly know why. But Hakari pretty much just like tells Ruha, like, dude, you've got like a very like interesting fit going on and you're running around this place like of course i can tell who i'm supposed to be going after here right but eventually akari is just like hey um there is one other guy but we actually split up to look for you as um as he's trying to explain like to ruha all of the basics going on here aruha is like all right this situation looks really dire as he looks over to the entrance of the train station as he just says they're here right and he's like um, and Hikari looks over to him and he's like, all right, there's three of them there. And Aruha's like, no, there's actually four sorcerers. And he's like, can you actually kill them dead and like get them out of here? Or kill them dead? Where do I get these words from? But Hikari just says like, hey, um, what sword is that that you're wearing? And um, he's like, hey, it's an ordinary self-defense sword. As um, Hikari just looks over to all of these people running around again and thinks for a second to something that Chihiro had told him in the past presumably on the train ride over here. As pretty much here just says like, hey, Hikari, you are actually very special. Normally there's only one kind of spirit energy in a person's body. And of course we know that, um, who's his face? Um, Hikari has two, of course, with the Iso, the Force Blast, and also with the Storehouse inside of him too. So he's very special, things considered. Chiro just continues saying like, hey, Normally, there's only one kind of spirit energy, energy in a person's body, and it is in a very limited capacity. So whenever you seal an internal contract with an enchanted blade, you pay the price of losing your original sorcery. As he just continues to say like, hey, so those with eternal contracts to the enchanted blades 
are basically defenseless. No blades, no sorcery. That's why they often need bodyguards. As, of course, Akari was thinking about this, as he's like, is that like some kind of special sword? Of course, we know it's not. So Aruha, all he has is a sword to protect himself. And all things considered, um, Hikari isn't the best, like, defensive guy around. Eventually, we see these four Ashaku sorcerers come up and almost start to jump um, both Akari and Aruha. Um, Aruha pretty much stands beside, behind Akari, and Akari's like, hey, get back behind me, as we see that he's like, I'll protect you, and he goes and summons the Iso mask, but before it can fully form on his face, we see that he, more blood just like shoots out of his nose, and like he can't competently do this right now again, as we see that he sort of just like falls and buckles onto the ground, as Ruha's like, damn it dude, like what's wrong with you, right? And at this point, the sorcerers are right above Aruha and Hikari, so Aruha's like, damn it, right? And we pretty much see that Aruha just thinks again to Beanie, who just said like, hey, we'll give you our lives so that you can escape. You better survive now or we will curse you forever. As we see Aruha sheds off his hat, throws it off to the side, and grabs the sword out of um, the sheath on his side. He pulls it out, and he just says the words, Roger that, as he thinks of Beanie's words, and just goes down and cuts down this first Hishaku member. We now see there's a second Hishaku member on their side of the room, and we see that um, Aruha's hat is flying towards him, almost being it, being him, putting him in a blind spot, almost. Aruha comes through, slices open his hat, and also slices through the head of this other Hishaku sorcerer, and eventually we see that Aruha has these sword skills as he pretty much just takes out the rest of these sorcerers here, right? As he pretty much says like, hey, sorry boy, like, sorry, I'm just a bit rusty to all of this. And, um, he, or, I almost said Hyuki again. Akari's just like, damn it, like, he really just took out four sorcerers with just an ordinary sword like that? Like, what is he doing here? As Aruha just thinks like, hey, um, they weren't really using weapons that they had at the fortress, so what was that? Of course, we know they're using the Doth and Seki there. So that's probably not something that all of the rank and, rank and file Hishaku members have, especially since, as far as we're aware, um, the price it takes on a body and it kills you after you use it, or at least that's what we saw with Tenry, but not really any knowledge besides for our Tenry case study so far. But um, Aruha just continues thinking like, hey, maybe they're limited in number, or maybe there's some other restriction, and he's like, well, um, there better be, or else that's like way too overpowered, right? We see more Hishaku sorcerers start running up and like, all right, there he is. Like, let's go get Aruha, right? And um, eventually, um, Aruha's like, damn, like, how many of these jerks work for the Hishaku? Like, it's really endless. As all of a sudden, um, Hyuki, or not Hyuki, it's Hikari, oh, um, is sitting on the ground. He hurt, here's uh, the train that pulls up behind him. And it says, like, all right, the doors are closing. And Hikari's like, all right, this will work. It's like, hey, Aruha, let's get on now. We see they both clamber onto the train. And as they get on, we see that Aruha's like, oh, damn it. They're everywhere. As we pan onto the train, and we see there are three lone Hishaku members in here. Of course, all of their blades. And Aruha's like, damn it. It looks like we're truly surrounded here. And all of a sudden, Hikari says, no, they actually are. As we look back from the compartment as we see these Hishaku sorcerers are sitting here and we suddenly see some bubbles start to bubble up in the air around him. As we look to the car behind where these sorcerers are standing and we see the silhouette of Chihiro walking onto the train car. Aruha sees this and just sort of like briefly takes in a look of of course Chihiro here as all of a sudden the automatic door opens up where Chihiro walks through this area and the Shaku sorcerers look behind them to see what's going on. But they see nothing as the one Hishaku guy just turns around and says, hey, where did that? And next thing we know, the three of them have all been sliced in half as Chihiro just sort of walks through them and walks over to Aruha, of course, cutting him down with the Intin. As he walks over to Aruha and just says like, hey, I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Ruha. My father spoke of you often. And all of a sudden, Ruha's like, an enchanted blade? But this guy, 
as he thinks back to, of course, when Bandana, not Bandana Guy, what was I calling him earlier? Beanie Guy, yeah, Beanie. Now that I think about it, I think it's actually a bandana and not a beanie, but I'm gonna stick with Beanie Guy because that's sort of the naming convention I've had this entire time. But Beanie Guy just says like, um, Aruha thinks to the conversation with Beanie Guy earlier as um, he just thinks like, man, that guy must be an imposter. Like there's no way Aruha could have a child and everything, right? As Jahiro just walks up to Aruha and just is like, hey, um, my father spoke of you very well often, Mr. Aruha. We'll take over as your protectors. And he just says, we promise not to let you die. And all of a sudden, um, Aruha just takes a look at Jahira's eye and just looks at him and then thinks of Kunishige as he just goes like, oh, he's, he's like, and he starts to realize like, oh, wow, this is, um, of course, Rokuhira's son. As he just thinks like, hey, um, can I fight for your sake again, Mr. Rokuhira? And... I love this, the final panel of the um, chapter is just another one of Chiro's stares as he just looks over in belief at Aruha and just goes, huh? As Hyuki, or not Hyuki, Hakari beside him just says like, hey, um, I think he might be a little screwy. And that is where we end off this chapter of Kagurabachi. I really enjoyed this chapter. It's very interesting to meet Yoji Aruha and sort of get a lot of exposition on him. Of course, like I sort of guess, like by the end of next chapter, um, Aruha would be met up with um, both Chiro and Hikari. So I am sort of glad that that pr prediction came into fruition. Um, I really like how they set it up here as how Hikari sort of gets the entrance on Aruha and sort of gets like those first few moments with him. And then after a few things go to shit, we see a very awesome moment where Aruha uses sword skills and everything, of course. And then, of course, going and ending it off with, all right, they're surrounded. Who comes in to save the day? But none other than Chihiro. And after Chihiro comes in, um, Aruha pretty much is like, oh, this guy is clearly Rokuhira's son. I sort of like how everybody sort of doubts him at first. And of course, as we saw last time with like sideburns and a few members of the Kabanagi, they suddenly realize like, oh, yeah. This guy's easily Rokuhira's son, just for the fact of, like, he is so much like him. So, very, very interesting there. And I think this is the third time that we've had one of these, like, deadpan Chihiro stares as um, somebody says something in weird to him. Because, of course, the first time was it when was whenever Sojo's this is like, yes, I loved Kunishige Rokuhira. And Chihiro's like, why do you love my dad? That's a little weird. Like, isn't that a little gay, dude? And um, we had that there. And then, of course, whenever he first met Hikari, there's the whole thing of, like, you can be my samurai! And it was sort of like, all right, what's this homophobic stuff going on here? And I love that Kagurabachi, at a certain point, is literally just, like, all of these wacky characters coming in around Chihiro, and Chihiro's just, like, the ultimate straight man. It's a very fun way to put it, but... I really like Aruha's character. I'm really happy that we get to see more of him. Um, and now Chihiro and Hikari have met up with him and they're going to be his protectors. Where we go next next chapter, I don't really have too much of an idea. I would think that we'd probably be heading back towards getting Aruha back with the rest of the Kabunaki, but I feel like it'd be more interesting if there was also um, a, a sort of a bigger threat that comes up while all of this is going on. Um, we're probably going to meet some Hashaku person, like some higher up person, probably not the leader like we met during the Rakuzachi arc, but somebody more important if I had to guess, but really I don't know where we can go on from here, but besides from that, this chapter is just genuinely good. Uh, is there really anything else to this chapter I want to note on? Um, really just that Aruha is pretty cool and I like him so far, and that's really the majority of what there is to this chapter, but... Um, post production Gold Pass 51 here. I did a really terrible ending this video, so I'm just going to refilm it here real fast. I think it'll be better, and the video may have a better quality than if I put that other dumpster fire of what I just recorded in the end of the video. But yeah, pretty much what I was saying is if you enjoyed chapter review, check out some of the other ones on channel. I think there's four of them up if I can sort of think about my math correctly, because I think I did three before this, so this is number four. So just three other chapter reviews you can go check out wherever you want to find them. Um, I will have a link down in the description down below, and also there'll be an in card at the end of this video for however long I put it up. I think it's like 15 cents or something, so click on that if you want more Kagurabachi chapter reviews. If not, um, thank you just for generally watching the video. Leave me a comment down below on what you guys think about Aruha's character. I think he's pretty cool, um, I, 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 but I would be interested to hear what you guys think about him. And yeah, with that, thank you guys so very much for watching, and I really don't have too much else to say, so 
thank you guys for watching this video a whole lot, and I'll catch you guys next time. This will be Gold Plasma 231, signing out, Bachi Bros.